22, come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus around the throne, yes, come we and let our joys be known.
Let us, let us bow our heads in prayer. We are thankful, merciful Father, for this annual gathering of ministers. We're thankful for, especially, for our visiting speaker, Dr. LaRue, Princeton University. He is no stranger to our ministry, and he must know that he is absolutely welcome among us. We trust that you trusted that you would give safe conduct to our speaker, and you have done that. As he ministers to us, help him to understand what we must understand, that we are fellow representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth for the salvation of the souls of men. As we worship with him and with you, may the God of heaven speak to all of our souls in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. Because 
of love so unconditional I can have life eternal Dr. E. Earl Cleveland presented our evening prayer. Ms. Noah Led Hutton just lifted our souls to the gates of paradise. I don't think we're giving out any telephone numbers this service as the last service, but God be praised. Season's greetings to all of you in the name of the Christ child who is also God with us. In answer to our Lord's divine imperative to preach the gospel in all the world to every creature, you have come. In fact, you have been coming for 28 years, not missing one. 28 years of continuing education for gospel ministry, sermons, seminars, workshops, and songs, and the fellowship's not bad either. <laughs> we welcome all of you under the general theme of ministering the gospel in contemporary times. God has been whispering in our ears lately that this will be the best year ever. May it come to pass in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now we are privileged tonight to be worshiping in the sanctuary of the Oakwood College Church. Dr. Craig Newburn, pastor, I sort of prevailed upon him to come up with us to say a few words. You need to get to know him. He is our spiritual leader. He's the high priest in these areas. Dr. Newburn. Thank you, Dr. Warren. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. For your sake, I wish. I wish that this were the afternoon of resurrection morning. And that all of you and a host of others were just outside the pearly gates and that I, St. Peter, <laughs> had the distinct privilege of using one of my keys and opening just one of those gates and letting all of y'all in. For your sake, I wish, but Like you, I'm just a pilgrim. And as pastor of this church, it is my pleasure to welcome you to just an oasis along the road to heaven. Yes. Sit heavy and drink deeply. It's good water that's here. Word is it's living water. They have been rumors that sometimes manna is served here. Yeah. 
but mind you, rumors. So as we said, rest heavy. The Lord is in this place. Your efforts at getting here, the Spirit will underwrite and he will more than reward you for having come. Don't allow the devil to cause you to frolic in the hallways. <laughs> and mind you, we do have commodious hallways, but no food is served there. The table of the Lord is set here. If ever the devil gets in this place, it's in the hallways. So, we know that from the doorway to this side, you're safe until you get to the door. And then between the door and this inner door, there's a no man's land. You remember that zone before the wall came down? You didn't want to get caught in there. So don't get caught out there. Amen. Rush into here. Amen. The city of refuge. Amen. And so Dr. Warren, I've, I've done my best to, to help you out later on with the issues of decorum. I've done my best to put the fear of the devil in them. <laughs> the Lord is in this place. Yes. And we welcome you to this place. Yes. And when that day comes when with St. Peter, yes. Yes. we all approach the pearly gates. Yes. <laughs> May it be our pleasure to go in together. Yes. God be with you. Well, as I said, you need to get to know our pastor. <laughs> now, as we prepare our hearts to look forward to the preacher for tonight and before Dr. Doggett formally introduces him, I feel constrained to make a statement which really will amount to a testimony. You deserve to know why the printed program does not reflect what you see on the rostrum tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, you may not be aware, but as late as high noon this past Friday, November 30, we did not have a keynote preacher for tonight. The particular preacher's photograph in the printed program notwithstanding, we did have one from last spring until 10 days ago, but bad news crashed the camp of Israel and canceled that initial appointment just 10 days ago. But then immediately we looked to the great city of Atlanta and secured an appointment whose photo handsomely dresses our printed program. But once again, Disappointing news caught up with us bearing the message that the state of Iowa was calling, at least implying that Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama and the presidential primaries needed him more than we. So I said, okay, all right. God is still God. <laughs> and he's God all by himself. It doesn't need anybody else. <laughs> He's God of emergencies. And when our backs are against the wall, Jesus is our scaffolding so that we need not fall. As a matter of fact, emergencies are his specialty. And all of our extremities are his opportunity. So the Spirit said to me during that, that shock, Call Jimmy Doggett. 
Jimmy, we have a problem. What's happening, Chief? I told him our predicament. Chief, no problem. I know a man. <laughs> Jimmy, I said, we do have a problem, and we don't have a man. Chief, no problem. I know a man. And then I thought he was kind of getting into his homiletical rhythm, and I thought he was going to say something like, I know a man from Galilee. You know? And if you're in sin, he'll set you free. <laughs> but he said, Chief, no problem. Give me a couple of hours. This was Friday afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Doggett, please come and introduce to us the servant priestly leader who has brought the word of God to us tonight in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Dr. Doggett. It's my privilege tonight to introduce the man of God who has come with a message from God. First had an opportunity to hear him preach this past June at the Hampton Ministers Conference when he astounded the audience with the depth of his knowledge and the spirituality that exuded from him. His name is Cleophas J. LaRue. He is the Associate Professor of Homiletics at Princeton Theological Seminary, the Francis Landy Patton Professor of Preaching, and he specializes in the theory and method of African-American preaching and worship. He's an ordained minister in the National Baptist Convention of America and is the former pastor of two churches in Texas as well as the former pastor of churches in Harlem and Jamaica, Queens, New York. He is a frequent speaker in churches and seminaries throughout the country and is a member of the Academy of Homiletics. He is a man of letters, having received his BA and MA degrees from Baylor University and his MDiv and PhD degrees from Princeton. He is an author, and many of us have used and read his books. Three of his books are The Heart of Black Preaching and Power in the Pulpit, How America's Most Effective Black Preachers Prepare Their Sermons. His latest book he edited is This Is My Story, Testimonies and Sermons of Black Women in Ministry. All three books are not self-published, but in fact are published by the Westminster John Knox Press. He resides with his family in Princeton, New Jersey. What I am impressed most with, with Dr. LaRue, who also preached at my church just two months ago and the spirit of the Lord fell down, is that he's not just a man of letters, he is indeed a scholar, but he's what I like to call a practical scholar. True wisdom is not the ability to take things simple and make them sound complex, but the ability to take things complex and make them sound simple. The story is told in Haddon Robinson's book, Biblical Preaching, of a young copyright ad man who decided he was going to come up with an advertisement for a brand new type of soap. He took his time and selected his words wisely, and he came up with this ad. The alkaline element and fats in this product are blended in such a way as to secure the highest quality of saponification, along with the specific gravity that keeps it on top of the water, relieving the bather of the trouble and annoyance of fishing around for it at the bottom of the tub during his ablution. When an older ad man who was experienced and wise read that, he simply tore it up. He took out a piece of paper and wrote these simple words, ivory soap, it floats. <laughs> Tonight, the preacher is not going to tell you about saponification and ablution. He's gonna let you know it floats. There's some people who like to take theological legalese 
and hide the deep themes of the scripture with all of these specialized words. Some people will stand up and say that we're in the throes of an existential dilemma. Homo sapiens are trapped in the throes of a problem because of genetic and environmental factors, both nature and nurture. We're sliding down the declivity slopes of depravity into the pit of ultimate destruction. But he's not gonna say that tonight. He's simply gonna say, we're sinners and we need Jesus. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce the speaker of the hour, Dr. Cleophas LaRue. He's going to preach a message that is both deep and practical, and he's going to do it so that the things of God are made clear. So I suggest that you strap yourselves in and get on this homiletical train because we're headed somewhere. Thank you for this day That was not promised to me Lord, I thank you for My help and strength And saving me One day When I think about The things I want Not the things God knows I really need there are miracles and blessings for me now we complain about our shoes when some people don't have feet we complain about no food or money but still the Lord does feed For when I think about The things I want Not the things God knows I really need You see there are so many miracles And blessings With my name on them Hallelujah We need to trust God more and learn to love him more hallelujah and believe and keep the faith in what we cannot see for when i think about the things i want not the things god knows i really really need you see that so many miracles and blessings with your name on them. Hallelujah. We need to trust God more. Isn't that true? And learn to love him more. Thank you, Jesus. And believe and keep the faith in what we cannot see. Blessings, miracles, and blessings, yes, there are miracles and blessings waiting for me. Now let me tell you about the miracles and blessings. Did he wake you up this morning? Miracle number one. Did he start you on your way? That's a blessing, yes. Did he put food on your table? That's miracle number two. I serve a God that is able. That's a blessing. He's been my doctor. 
in a sick room that's a miracle he's been my lawyer in a courtroom wish i could get a witness this evening he's a good god yeah now he's an old time god yes and he's an awesome god yeah 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 i said good god i said old time god and he's an awesome god can i get a witness this evening anybody that can turn water into wine that's a miracle he can save this old soul of mine that's a blessing yeah one more time good god and he's an old time god he's an awesome god yeah 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 yes there are miracles miracles and blessings i don't know what you need tonight but god has miracles he has miracles and blessings for you hallelujah 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 god bless you this evening Good evening to you. I thank God for the opportunity and privilege to come this way to Dr. Warren, and Dr. Newburn, and Dr. Doggett, and Dr. Cleveland, and Dr. Jones. How yeah, you been? All right, all right, all right. And to all of you, my sisters and brothers in Christ Jesus, I'm, I'm glad to be here. And I don't mind standing in. I'm just glad to preach. I was in Minneapolis at the Academy of Homiletics when I got Dr. Doggett's call. And that was Friday. And early Saturday morning, the airline called, 3.30 in the morning. Said, get up and get out now. A storm is coming. And if you don't leave now, you'll be stuck. And I knew I had to be here. So I got up and got out of there and preached this morning in Charlotte and then caught the plane to come here. But I'm always glad to say a word for the Lord, and I mean that. It's my first time at this wonderful school, Oakwood, and it is just marvelous. I, the concert this evening just Bless my heart. Amen. I could have listened to them all evening, but I knew after a while I had to say something. I felt like that man who forgot his mother's birthday. And to make amends, he went to the pet shop and bought a rare bird that spoke five languages. <laughs> Shipped the bird off to his mother, thought he'd wait, give her five or six days to enjoy all those languages. He called her five or six days later, said, Mama, how, uh, you got your present? Oh, thank you, son, yes, yes, yes. How did you like that bird? She said, oh, son, that bird was delicious. <laughs> He said, Mama, you, you, you weren't supposed to eat that bird. That, that bird spoke five languages. She said, well, he should have spoken up when he saw that water boy. <laughs> so as, as, as much as I enjoyed that concert, I knew later on I was going to have to speak up. So thank you again for the invitation. Now, people say to me from time to time, well, we thought you were going to preach a Princeton sermon. I'm, I'm not sure what kind of sermon that is. 
I'm going to do my best to preach a biblical sermon here tonight. I don't know what a Princeton sermon is. I want to call your attention to Matthew, the 14th chapter, verses 22 through 30. Matthew, the 14th chapter, verses 22 through 30. And I'm reading from the New International Version. And it reads thus. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out saying, Lord, save me. That's what I want to talk about for just a few minutes here tonight. I want to talk about three kinds of trouble. Three kinds of trouble. Let us pray. Come now, O Lord, in power and in might. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Three kinds of trouble. The scene depicted for us in Scripture is a midnight scene. It is the night following the day of the feeding of the 5,000. The crowds had been with Jesus all day long. They pressed in upon him. He ministered to them. He taught them. He fed them. And then late in the evening, he sent the multitudes away. He instructed his disciples to get into a boat and go to the other side of the lake. While Jesus himself turned his steps toward the mountain slopes where he intended to go and spend the night in prayer to his father. Think about that. Jesus spending the night in prayer. And we try to pray between commercials <laughs> because we don't want to miss anything on TV. And then we wonder why we have no power. Jesus headed toward the mountain slopes to spend the night in prayer to his father. And, 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 and the disciples got into the boat and headed toward the other side of the lake but they had not been long into their journey before a tempestuous storm arose. Yeah. Hear me now. They are out there at the request of Jesus. Yeah. Some people think that when you obey Jesus, you ought not have any storms in your life. But that's when storms come. When you make up in your mind that you're gonna do what the master says you can expect to have some storms in your life. So they started across and the wind raged and they were experienced fishermen. They were accustomed to these squalls happening up quickly on the lake. But on this particular night, they could not bring the boat under control. They struggled to bring it under control. And it does not matter how strong you are. 
if you stay in a storm long enough, it will take your strength. Bit by bit, moment by moment, little by little, their strength began to fail them. Not in Matthew's gospel, but in Mark's gospel of this same scene, Mark says that Jesus saw them as they toiled. Oh, what comfort, what assurance to know that whereas we shall not be spared from storms, Jesus has his eyes on us when we are in our storms. He saw their strength fail them. He saw their hearts overcome with fear. He saw anxiety grow as they tried to bring the boat under control. He had his eyes on them. And that brings me to my first kind of trouble. Now don't wait too long to say amen because I won't be up here long now. So you, 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 you come on and get with me and I, I, won't, I won't be here long. It, it, that brings me to the first kind of trouble that I want to talk about here tonight. And that first trouble is real trouble. Don't you let anybody fool you. There is in this life a thing called real trouble. After you have brushed aside all you can brush aside, lightly dismissed all you can lightly dismiss, joked away all you can joke away, there is a core in everybody's life where real trouble will settle every now and then. Real trouble. Yes, sir. We used to sing a song in my home state of Texas. It said, I don't know why I have to sigh sometimes. I don't know why I have to cry sometimes. That would be a perfect day, but trouble gets in my way. I don't know why, but I'll know by and by. It's called real trouble, and it finds all of us after a while. You know, friends and family members, they mean well when they say to you, oh, quit being so negative. Why don't you think about something else? Put your mind on something else. Quit worrying about your trouble. But when you are in real trouble, that's all you can think about. They mean well when they say to you, why don't you, why don't you go to the mall and go shopping? You can go to that mall if you want to. But when you come out of there, you won't remember where you parked your car. Because real trouble has a way of gripping the whole of our existence. From time to time in everybody's life, we are confronted with a thing called real trouble. You try, you try telling those brave soldiers, those brave American soldiers in Iraq, you try telling them there's no such thing as real trouble. In a foreign country, don't even speak the language. Not sure who your friends are. People shooting at you night and day. That's called real trouble. And it finds all of us from time to time. We face real trouble as we try to come to grips with the absurdities, the complexities, and the contradictions in our lives. And I don't want to just use some words. I want to tell you what they mean. When, when, when I say the absurdities of life, I mean the stuff that happens to us in this life that just does not make sense. In fact, it makes such little sense that it seems downright foolish. And therefore, we call it the absurdities of life. We face real trouble trying to come to grips with the absurdities of life. The stuff that happens to us in this life that just does not make sense. And when it's happening to you, you can't even use good grammar because you're trying to deal with it. You find yourself saying, ain't no reason for this here stuff to be happening to me. It's called the absurdities of life. The stuff that happens to us in this life that just does not make sense. You see, we all have some things we want to achieve out of life. 
That's over here. We all have some things to which we aspire, some goals that we'd like to reach. That's over here, what we want out of life. But what we get out of life, that's over here. And that broad empty space in the middle between what we wanted out of life and what we actually get out of life, that broad empty space, it's called the absurdities of life. You find yourself standing over here saying, Lord, why am I so far away from what I wanted out of life as opposed to what I'm getting out of life? Doesn't make any sense. You know, uh, 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 a man was asleep one night and he awoke only to discover that his wife was sitting up in the bed looking at him (laughs) while he was asleep. And that man got up. (laughs) And I don't blame him. And he said to his wife, honey, why, why, why are you sitting up here looking at me while I'm asleep? And she said, oh, I don't know. I was just sitting up here thinking about what I wanted and what I got. And and if you're not careful, it'll keep you up at night too. It's called the absurdities of life. The stuff that happens to us in this life that just does not make sense. Those, Those of us who have children, those of us who have children, we, 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 we try to come to grips with it all the time. You try to raise your daughter or your son in a Christian home. You struggle to get them an education. You want them to have a better life than you had. And then you look around and the very one you don't want her to have, that's the one she'll come home with. And the more you talk against him, the closer she gets to him. And you find yourself saying, Lord, why is my child so far away from what I wanted for her? and what she's about to get out of life. Oh, men, we face the absurdities of life as we grow older in life. Men, you know, when you are a young man, you think you're gonna live forever. But when you get into your 50s and 60s, you start to hear a clock ticking. And you begin to know that you won't have as much time as you once had. And if you're not careful because you come to know that some of your dreams won't be realized and some of your hopes won't be realized, if you're not careful, you will find yourself looking around trying to blame others for why you did not accomplish what you thought you should have accomplished in this life. Do you hear me now? Yeah, you find yourself saying, you know, I'd have more and I'd be more in life if it wasn't for my wife and these old bad children. No, no, it's called the absurdities of life. It's just stuff that happens to all of us in this life that does not make sense. And we will not come to all that we had hoped to achieve in this life. We face real trouble trying to come to grips with the absurdities of life. We face real trouble trying to come to grips with the complexities of life. Uh, There are people on TV and radio who have gotten rich handing out easy answers to the complexities of life. But there are some things that we face in this life that defy an easy answer. There are some burdens that we have to carry in this life, not for a day, not for a week, but sometimes down through the years. And they create in us complexities. If you move too quickly, you'll hurt innocent people. If you move too abruptly, you'll do something for which you will be sorry. And so you just have to bear up under the weight of that load until God steps in and says, that's enough, my child. You've borne that burden long enough, but we call them the complexities of life, the stuff in all of our lives that defy easy answers. Ah, we face real trouble as we try to come to grips with the contradictions in our lives. When I say contradictions, by that I mean when my, when my walk starts to run into my talk. When what I do makes a lie out of what I say. You see, my walk and my talk ought to be parallel. But when my walk and my talk start to run into one another, that's a contradiction. And we all have them in our lives. You know how you've said to God, oh, if you get me out this time, I won't go back there anymore. 
But before you know it, you're right back there again. And even when you walk away, you're too weak to stay away. It's called the contradictions in our lives. There's no sense in you walking around talking about you don't know why some people don't like you. There are some days when I don't like myself because of the contradictions in my life. And we all have them and we face real trouble. The disciples out on the sea that night faced real trouble. But there is a second kind of trouble here tonight. Uh, the first one is really happening to you. It's called real trouble. But the second kind of trouble is imaginary trouble. That's in your mind, imaginary trouble. When, when Jesus saw that they had toiled out there on that lake long enough, he decided to leave his place in the mountains and come walking toward them. And he was so prayed up and he had so much power that when he left terra firma, that land, and stepped on to H2O, that's water. He had so much power that he caught gravity by surprise. And instead of going down in the water, he just kept on walking. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. He went walking to them on the water. But they had had so much trouble out there that night that they just started looking for trouble. Sometimes you can have so much trouble in your life that you don't even recognize help when it comes your way. You would have thought they would have been glad to see Jesus, but they'd had so much trouble that they didn't recognize that it was Jesus. You know what they said? All the trouble we've had out here tonight, the last thing we need to see is a ghost. Here comes a ghost. Lord have mercy. And I want to tell you tonight, I want to tell you tonight, uh, Simon Peter was a cursing fisherman. And I just believe Peter said some stuff that night that Matthew couldn't write down in this Bible. Oh, 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 when he thought he saw a ghost. But you can be in so much trouble that you just start looking for trouble. And whatever you look for hard enough, you will find it. Some people spend their days looking for slights and insults. They have an inferiority complex. They always think somebody's trying to put them down or talk about them. And if they walk up to you and uh, you really don't see them and you don't say good morning, they won't speak to you for six months because they were just looking for some trouble and looking for something to complain about. Whatever you look for hard enough, you will find it. But most of the time, it's imaginary trouble. There was a man named Mr. Big. He lived in a small town. And Mr. Big had more land, he had more money, he had more everything than anybody. And one day a new man moved to town and the new man was seen going into the bank every day. Uh -huh. And Mr. Big just started imagining all kinds of things. That what is he going into that bank for every day? Is he borrowing money? Does he have money? Is he buying up land? What is he doing? And when Mr. Big could stand it no longer, he walked into the bank in front of the new man, walked up to the teller's window and said, I want to borrow $10,000 on my signature alone. And the lady said, no problem, Mr. Big, here it is. And Mr. Big got his $10,000 and he turned to the new man. He said, now, I've just gotten $10,000 on my signature alone. What have you come in here for? And the new man said, I am coming here for what I come in here for every morning, a drink of water. <laughs> Imaginary trouble can run you into real trouble if you are not careful. Really, my brothers and sisters, we have enough trouble in life. Don't go around making up trouble. We have enough trouble. You don't need imaginary trouble. Well, there it is. I'm almost through. Real trouble, 
imaginary trouble. And there's one more trouble. And I shall take my seat. And that last trouble that I want to talk about is satanic trouble. Satan inspired trouble. When, when they recognized that it was indeed Jesus, Peter said, Lord, if it's really you, let me come to you walking on the water. And Jesus said, come. And when Peter stepped out of that boat to go to Jesus, the devil jumped on him because he's the one who creates doubt in our lives. He reminded Peter of his past failures. He magnified his difficulties. He made him remember all the trouble he had been in that night. And Peter started to go down and he cried out saying, Lord, save me. That's the third kind of trouble, satanic trouble. Now, I'm sorry, I have not come here tonight to shock modern day sensibilities by talking about the devil. And I, I want you to know, when I first went to Princeton 12 years ago, I quit using the word devil because I didn't want them to think I was a back number from Texas. But when I got up to Princeton and found out who was there, I started using that word again. I come to tell you tonight that the devil is real. He is a superior enemy whom we cannot withstand except God comes to our rescue. The devil is real. I do not have a theology of the devil for I agree with the reformer Martin Luther when he said recognize the devil for who he is and then get away from him as fast as you can. But I come to tell you tonight, the devil is real. He shows up from time to time throughout scripture and he's real. You call him what you will or may. You call him by his biblical name, Daimonion. You call him by one of his theological names, an inferior demiurge, but he's real. You call him a spirit of againstitness, or a notion of negativity, but he's real. You call him a psychological dysfunction or a principle of evil operating within the confines of the universe, but he's real. Wherever he shows up, he always causes trouble. In Genesis, he's a tempter. In Revelation, he's a deceiver. Isaiah called him Lucifer, a fallen son of the morning. And Paul called him the ruler of the darkness of this world. He tormented Job in the Old Testament and he opposed Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus who tried to find something good to say about everybody said of the devil that he's a murderer and a liar. He's real. And when he comes into your life, he tries to make you believe that he's going to have the last word about your situation. When he comes into your life, he tries to make you believe that he's going to put on you more than God can handle. But oh, I come to tell you tonight, when the devil comes into your life, hold on. Your salvation is nearer than when you first believed. Hold on. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Hold on. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy, joy, joy will come in the morning. Hold on. God is still on the throne. Hold on. The storm is passing over. Hold on. I come to tell you tonight, no matter what kind of trouble you have, I really know a man and I want to recommend him to you tonight. His name, his name is Jesus. Jesus. I recommend him to you tonight. He can calm every doubt, still every fear, overcome every difficulty. His name is Jesus. And no matter what kind of trouble you have, he can fix it for you. God bless you. Thank you.
Все, один дурачок, да. The room grew still as she made her way to Jesus. She stumbled through the tears and made her blind. Yeah. She felt such pain. Some spoke in anger, heard folks whisper, "There's no place here for her kind." Still on, she came through the shame that flushed her face. Until at last, she knelt before his feet. And though she spoke no words, everything she said was heard. As she poured her love for the master from her box of alabaster. My praise on him like oil from Mary's alabaster box. Don't be angry if I wash his feet with my tears and I dry them with my hair. You weren't there. Jesus found me. You did not feel what I felt when He wrapped His love and arms around me. And you don't know the cost of the oil in my alabaster box. Now I can't forget. The way my life used to be, I was a prisoner to the sin that had me bound. I spent all of my days, I poured my life without measure into a little treasure box I thought I had found. But until that day. When Jesus spoke to me and healed my soul with the wonder of His touch, and now I'm giving back to Him all the praise He's worthy of, 'cause I've been forgiven, and that's why. Praise on Him like oil from Mary's alabaster box. Now don't be angry if I wash His feet with my tears and I dry them with my. No. 
just before we stand for prayer, Elder LaRue came to our church at Madison Mission and preached. And I told him then, and I'm telling her again tonight, you can come back here anytime. <laughs> can I get a witness in here tonight? Shall we stand for the benediction? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for sending your manservant to speak to all of these workers for you. We thank thee for what he has told us tonight. We thank you, Jesus, that you gave him an insight on some of the problems that we have in this life. And we thank you for helping him to explain why we're having so many problems in our lives. And we pray that you take us just as we are, make us what we ought to be, and then send us on our way preaching the gospel as we ought to be preaching it. Guide and direct and keep us throughout this meeting. May it be a benefit to each one of us that when we leave this place and return home to our families and to our churches, that we will say it was good to have been there. But we ask it all in the worthy name of Jesus. Yeah. Amen, amen again. Yeah.